start. Good evening. On behalf of the Patrick Eisenbrand family, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this celebration in honor of the life of a wonderful, caring, intelligent, unique individual, Robert Lee Patrick. I can't think of anyone who deserves recognition and celebration more. The only thing wrong about this gathering is that the fellow we're celebrating and honoring isn't here. Curse you, cancer. Uh, as we begin, let me remind you to turn off your cell phones. And that's not just because I don't want to be interrupted by the sound of the ringing phone, but, but also they're doing a FaceTime connection to the other room. So uh, evidently the wires would get crossed. I, I um, my name is Kip Niven. I'm a Kansas City native, a graduate of Shawnee Mission East High School, as were the four Patrick and Eisenbrand brothers. And for the past nearly 45 years, I've also been a professional actor. Diane might have made a huge mistake when she asked me to MC this evening. I mean, giving an actor a podium, a captive audience, and no specific time limit, and then expecting him to talk about someone other than himself, probably not the best choice. Now, now, don't get me wrong, I will, of course, be talking about Bob Patrick as he relates to me. <laughs> Bob and I go way back, um, 60 plus years, in fact, because, you see, I was a self-adopted uh, member of the Patrick Eisenbrandt family. When I was in first grade at Porter School, I was in class with a kid named David Eisenbrandt, the grown-up version of that kid is right over there. <laughs> You'll be hearing from him later. By the time uh, we were at Indian Hills Junior High School, I was in homeroom or unified studies with Ed Patrick, and that seventh grader grew up to be that 70-year-old. <laughs> You'll hear from him later, too. In no time at all, Ed and I became best friends, and I mean best friends. I couldn't possibly calculate the hours I spent in the Patrick Eisenbrandt home. And, and it wasn't as if there weren't already quite enough teenage boys in residence there. Picture this, those of you who are parents out there, four teenage sons, only four years separating the oldest, Jim, where are you Jim? Jim, you'll hear from him later, from the youngest, Bobby with Ed and David in the middle, the same age, same grade. This was sort of a testosterone version of the Brady Bunch. But what made this family work was at the head of that family, there were two remarkable individuals who managed to keep things running unbelievably smoothly and efficiently and successfully, and that would be mom and dad. Faye and Leslie. A more formidable and generous and gracious couple would be hard to imagine. As I said, I spent a great deal of time with my self-adopted family, especially with Ed. Of course, there was school and intramurals and pep club and Boy Scouts and Troop 91 at the Village Church, also with the other brothers, and Homestead Country Club as Ed's guest. In fact, I probably spent more time at Homestead than most members did. And there was always double dating. I was there when Ed and Jane first started going out together. And even working side by side jobs with David and Bobby as well, jobs that we sort of inherited from Jim at Shalinsky's Rexall Drug in Kansas City, Kansas. Now there are tales about this, but they'll have to wait to be told until we all have drinks in our hands later. Anyway, all this time, there was always Ed and Dave's and Jim's kid brother, Bobby, hanging around. Now, I say kid brother instead of little brother because, to my memory, Bobby was never little. And let me tell you, Ed and Bobby were a formidable pair in those driveway basketball games. Height, 
you never wanted to work inside against the Patrick Brothers version of the Twin Towers. But there Bobby was, on and off the court, quiet, thoughtful, intelligent, with a great sense of humor, a terrific kid brother. So eventually, Ed and I went off to college at Bailey University, and that story will also require a couple of drinks to tell. <laughs> and soon after, Bobby went off to K-State. To, to after college and the Army, I went to Los Angeles to start my career. Meanwhile, Jim was becoming a lawyer. David was becoming a veterinary pathologist. Ed was becoming a pediatrician. Bobby was receiving his multiple degrees and then became an attorney for the EPA. And I was performing co-starring roles on Chips and Knight Rider. <laughs> well, eighty percent of those five boys turned out okay. That's... Twenty years ago, right about now in fact, I returned to Kansas City to live and work and renewed my friendship with Ed and Jane, who were then by then living in Topeka, and my friendship with Bobby, who was by then with his magnificent wife and life partner and best friend, Diane. The four of them, Ed and Jane and Bobby and Diane, would often come to Lawrence to see me in a performance there. And I saw the whole family very briefly at Leslie's uh, funeral service. A couple of years ago, I was invited to join in celebrating Bob's retirement at his and Diane's beautiful home, where I got my first glimpse of Bob's uh, nature photography. Sensational. Then, not too long after that, I learned from Ed of Bobby's health battle. Curse you, cancer. The last time I saw Bobby was at Bob and Diane's home. Ed had come over from Topeka to visit and had stopped at Arthur Bryant's at the Legends for some takeout barbecue. This was something that he and Bobby would share often, a frequent occurrence for them. But this time, I was invited to join the feast. Just the three of us, and of course, the ever-present, beloved Sashi. Bob was wearing a K-State cap, curse you cancer and chemo, for taking that magnificent hair of his, easily the finest afro that any white man ever wore. Well, as you can imagine, that lunch turned into more of a feast of memories than a brisket. By the time I left, we were all full of both. So many wonderful memories. When Diane asked me to MC this event, I was, to say the least, humbled and honored. And now I'm going to try to earn my keep as an MC, and we'll turn the podium to over to other friends and family members and colleagues. We'll share some of them their uh, memories of this remarkable, one of a kind human being, Robert Lee Patrick. First, let me introduce Bob's former boss, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region Center, 7 Regional Council, David Kozak. David? I wish I had co-starring and chips on my resume. <laughs> I'll so trade you. <laughs> You ever Bob's boss? <laughs> so, so I have the privilege and honor of being up here to represent Bob's other family, his EPA family. And so while I'm going to be saying the words, I think the sentiments um, come from everybody at EPA because we really did think uh, of Bob as being part of a big family. So I was an eight year old kid in 1970 when EPA came into being. And I was a 13-year-old teenager in 1975 when Bob started working for EPA, right? And I have a vivid memory from that time. My family was moving to New York, and when we got off the plane and stepped onto the streets of New York City, my eyes started burning because the air was so stinking dirty, right? At that time, there were many places around the country that were like that, including here in the Midwest. So fast forward 40 years, right? I went out last Sunday for a bike ride to think about what I wanted to say today. Um, because being on my bike is one of the places I do my thinking. So I headed past UMKC where Bob got his law degree and then pedaled on by Westport and through Midtown and 
uh, down Broadway, past places where Bob probably drank beer and listened to rock and roll and played pinball with his friend Tim Amston. Right? And I went on by the building where he started his career at EPA in downtown Kansas City. And then on down to the river where I could look across the water and see the building where we all worked together for so many years with Bob. So this was the same day as the air show, right? And Blue Angels were flying. And it was really cool, <laughs> if you've ever seen the Blue Angels. And while they were great, what really struck me that day as I was thinking about Bob was not the Blue Angels, but the Blue Skies. Um, because it's that way now in most places, on most days in this country. And so many, many people have helped make that happen around this country over the last 40 years, but it's not a stretch to say that in this part of the country, when you or your kids breathe deep and you get a breath of clean air, Bob Patrick had a big hand in it. So about five years ago, when Bob was still at EPA, before he retired, we held a day-long office retreat right here in this place. Right? And we spent that day doing a lot of deep thinking, like soul-searching kind of stuff, about what we were doing well, what we were not doing well, how we were not serving the American people as well as we could, and what we could do to get better. And Bob was here that day, fully engaged, right? Um, and I think he must have liked it, because he decided before he died that he wanted to have a celebration of life right here. So it's fitting we're here in this place, because the things we talked about that day as an office um, were the same kind of thing, and the things we're aiming to do to get better at making this planet we share a cleaner and safer place, those are the same things Bob did faithfully and tirelessly for 37 years. He was always trying to get better at being a public servant. Now Bob was a peace-loving guy, right? I've heard more than one person say that he was really a hippie at heart. <laughs> he didn't like conflict. But make no mistake about it, he was a warrior for clean air. We live in a country where warriors come in all shapes and sizes. You don't have to have a weapon to be a warrior. You can use your heart, your mind, your voice, your pen. And that's what Bob did so well for 37 years. He was a warrior for clean air. He knew um, a long time ago what President Obama said earlier this month. President Obama said, this blue marble belongs to all of us. We only get one home. We only get one planet. There is no plan B. And Bob knew that. Right? So I started EPA in 1989. And for the first 15 years of my career, um, Bob was kind of inscrutable to me. I didn't do Clean Air Act work. And we kind of ran in different social circles. All I really knew about Bob, for some years, was that he was this tall, thin guy with wild hair and bad suits. <laughs> He drove a Mazda sports car that was way too small for his big body, and that he was supposedly this legendary Clean Air Act savant, right? So much later, when I became regional counsel and his boss, although I never thought of my boss as having a boss relationship, we just worked together, I worked with him a whole lot, right? And I got to know him much more. Um, and I learned that he was indeed a Clean Air Act savant. Um, I trusted him completely, relied on him tremendously, and I learned from him. I also came to know what a great human being he was. Now, the Clean Air Act, for those of you who don't do environmental law, it's hard stuff, right? It is the rocket science of environmental law. It is our brain surgery. Um, no one I have come across uh, understood it like Bob, and he was known throughout the country as a top Clean Air Act lawyer. But his real gift was not his superior knowledge, although it was superior. Um, his real gift was his ability to impart that knowledge in a way that other people really listened. Too, right? One of his colleagues um, said he was literally in awe of Bob's ability to advise the program clients so well and so much. Um, I think that feeling was pretty universal. Without getting too into the weeds, here's a little about what, what Bob did right, at EPA. So in the Clean Air Act, there's six big pollutants we regulate. For each one, our, our states have to submit these big plans to us every few years. And we have to do this long, extensive technical and legal review. And then there's a whole other host of other things on top of that, greenhouse gases and permits and a whole bunch of stuff. You get the idea, right? In most other regions, there are a team of lawyers who do that work. In our region, we had Bob, <laughs> the one-man show, right? Um, and it was really quite remarkable. So he didn't start out being the rock star national lawyer that he was by the time I got to be regional counsel. There were some early years, and there were some interesting stories from the early years when I was 
13, right? <laughs> and so um, it's our privilege and pleasure to have with us Dave Tripp, another, a former regional counsel at EPA, who worked with Bob for many years during his early years, and he's going to share some stories, at least the ones that folks can remember from back then. <laughs> Thank you, David, and I'll try to keep this fairly brief. Uh, I also want to let you know that I'm not here just speaking on my memories of Bob. I'm also here speaking on behalf of Martha Steinkamp, who was a regional counsel, and Jane McAllister, who was a close friend of Bob's in many of his environmental cases. Uh, both of those people have stayed in close contact with Bob, and they both want the family, Diane, to feel that they are here because they helped me with what I'm about to talk about. Um, the early days of EPA were different, and it was a long time ago, so memories may be fuzzy. But, uh, we, we do want to be a part of this celebration. I'm speaking for Martha and Jane and myself, in the sense that we have memories of Bob that go back a long way. And uh, he was a remarkable person. He obviously had a long and interesting career, and he earned a reputation as a senior legal advisor, as Dave has said. But we want to add some things that may not be well known. and. Uh, before his early career, things that contributed to his uh, strengths, his calmness of mind, and his quick reflexes. Uh, Bob was able to deal in any venue. Uh, he worked with many lawyers from our Washington Office of Counsel at that time who were very proud of their pedigrees. Uh, UMKC, K-State, didn't really register in their world. But Bob absolutely held his own and he proved himself worthy before all of them. I wanted to talk a moment about Bob the Wildcat. I wasn't there, but I just can tell you what I heard from Bob and what we remember about Bob. There was a time when uh, Bob became, apparently became very involved with food and weightlifting. And uh, Bob, Bob himself said that he became known as the Wildcat and also he mentioned moose. <laughs> and um, he also uh, admitted at that time that he was somewhat bulky. Now, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> and people who were at K-State then and later remember that those might have been the overall years. And we have no evidence. We have no evidence. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine that Bob might have been the uh, Bob, the law student, of course, went across the street almost at, at UMKC Law School, where he was an excellent student. And out of school, his resume got the attention of John Morse the first EPA regional council that we all worked for. Bob was hoping to work in an agency where he could practice administrative law, and he applied several places, including a prestigious job at the University of Missouri, uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the Missouri Public Service Commission. He got an offer, but lucky for EPA, lucky for Bob and Diane, he'd already accepted an offer at EPA Region 7, which is how he came to work. At the early EPA, it was uh, shortly after the chaos years when Art Scrapman and others and I uh, wandered in from different directions and agencies were slammed together. Nobody knew who was in charge. Programs were at their very early stages. But I tell you, Bob got there. He had cleared out a little bit. And we were actually working on state implementation plans. There was an anecdote that I think several of us know the inside story about how this uh, record was built when state implementation plans were being put together. There was one individual who was responsible for this on the program side who was very jealous of his records. In fact, he accumulated all of his records in his office. And he, he was very uh, possessive of those. And it took Bob a long time to figure that he didn't have to go recreate these by talking to the states and uh, talking to other agency people. He could simply go into this office and it was a really important record. It might be under the footwell where this individual could tap his feet on the records and be sure that it's safe. But Bob got through all of that and he learned at EPA that there were a couple of important things. Uh, one was that just because no one knows where the records are doesn't mean they don't exist. <laughs> and the other thing was that engineers and science-based professionals never throw anything away. Um, there, were, there were times in EPA's communications that were, uh, in today's view, kind of hilarious. You might call those days earlier the pre-fax era, because there weren't faxes. And of course, that was succeeded by the uh, email era. When Bob was there, we were still in the pre-fax era. And the method of communication when faxes finally came along would be, that company's in trouble, send them a fax. Of course, 
The fax was usually a partial copy of something slightly sideways and faded. <laughs> but came through in the middle of the night, and then half of it was there and half of it wasn't. You <laughs> had to go back and recreate. Well, we worked through that, and uh, Bob was able to uh, accomplish successful communications with all of our brother and sister federal agencies, except the Department of Justice, which still operated on telegraph and carrier <laughs> There was no effective delivery of communications with the Department of Justice. Bob's early um, legal training, I think you would say, was through a strong and effective mentor and example, and that was John Morse, the regional counsel, a professional, had been a, a regional counsel, a general counsel at the Kansas Department of Transportation. He knew about employee relations, uh, all the contract and enforcement and litigation matters that we faced uh, were very old business to John, and he did a nice job of training all of us, and he and Bob, I would say, really bonded. While the uh, legal mentoring was going on, there was also the social mentoring. And if you wandered through the memory room with some photographs of Bob and <clears throat> other people at EPA, you might have seen the one of Bob standing at a pinball machine. And uh, that was, in, in fact, part of his early career. And his partner in pinball, I might have been there sometimes, <laughs> uh, was a double graduate, a master's in advertising, University of Iowa, and an Iowa law grad. So you've got to think about Mad Men, the television show, meets L.A. Law. This, this person is all of that. It's much to get. He was, he was a, a character in one of his, I believe one of his poems will be with us tonight. He has graduated from advertising and law and has become a poet. So I'm proud of that. But Bob, uh, Bob practices pinball skills. He, he worked hard at that. He was the first stringer within a matter of weeks. <laughs> Bob also was a rock and roll fan, no doubt about that, and we all learned that early. Many of us, um, you know, we were Moody Blues, um, Pete Seeger, uh, Van Morrison. Bob had a little different twist. Bob was open to what might be the more, um, I, don't, I wouldn't call it seamy, but it's wrong. <laughs> so we quickly learned that Bob uh, loved meatloaf. And I see Diane got out one of the meatloaf covers. It surprised me, though, because it wasn't the one I thought you were going to bring out. Because um, I'm going to tell you a little story about meatloaf and sports cars. Because Bob started out like the rest of us driving a beater. I don't remember the, the brand. He had a nice, uh, a nice Vita uh, Carmen Ghia for a while. And then he had something that wasn't so nice for a while. And then he graduated to a brand new bright red Mazda RX-7, which every car guy in the agency was drooling over this car. It was beautiful, it was fast, and it had clutches that burned out with regularity. <laughs> so there was an image of Bob going around that might have been partly manufactured. Remember, we had an ad guy working with this. This image was a Bob on Ward Parkway, dark night, meatloaf blaring, <laughs> out of the hill, looking for somebody to drag race. <laughs> I don't know that ever happened, but I think it's all together. So uh, that Mazda went away eventually, and then I, I heard from Bob, and he had another brand new bright red Mazda RX-7. He just loved those cars. Well, Bob's career was remarkable, and David's going to talk a little more about that. I, I don't know what more we can say. Um, the uh, prefax era gave way to email. Uh, snail mail has gone away completely. The implementation plan development still goes on. It's a long, brutal process. But as David said, I think we know that we have gone from announcements in federal register perhaps decades ago to fully formed state implementation plans. And Bob was a part of that. He did it with a touch of class. He did it with some happiness in his heart because it was it was what he did. He, uh, you know, you got to love federal registers to do this, and it's hard to love federal registers. <laughs> we all know that. But Bob accomplished that. So commendable in the, in the face of his difficulty. Um, I think we all know by now that Bob had a rock and roll heart, but I told David the other day, Bob also had an EPA heart. He really lived and loved EPA. So, final word from Martha and Jane for me. Um, everything we say about Bob and the history is kind of insignificant to Bob's history with Diane. He loved and he leaned on Diane, and we all saw that. We all admired that relationship. So, I think um, <clears throat> two, two parting words to Bob. Well done, true and faithful friend. To Diane, we hope your heart is lightened by knowledge that Bob did the full EPA life, faced it with a smile, left us smiling, 
в этом революции. since then he taught us well and we've learned to stand on our own. I think Bob is really proud, rightly so, of what he did to make sure the agency was going to be okay when he was gone. It's pretty fashionable of late to talk about building a network to advance your career. I'm pretty sure the idea of doing that would have made Bob's skin crawl, right? <laughs> he didn't try to build a network. He did something much better um, and much more real. He built lasting relationships, right? By being the genuine, sincere guy he was. And there were people all over EPA, all over the states, all across the country um, who just raved about Bob and loved working with him. Um, and I think Diane has a bunch of remembrances, and, and if you are interested in seeing them, I'm sure she would share. Um, because the outpouring uh, of feeling for Bob that came from the EPA community um, is just remarkable. I recently read a book, the name of it was titled Quiet. And it's about how society undervalues introverts. One of the ideas in this book is that we've kind of lost our way a little bit as a society in terms of what we value in people. That we've come increasingly to value a culture of personality where things like gregariousness and magnetism and fame and ambition and wealth and status are what matter. And we live in a world of selfies and trying to get on the jumbotron and sending out to the world every little thing we've done and every accomplishment we've made. And you know, some call it the culture of the big me, where perception matters as much as reality. And what we've lost, this book posits, is a culture of character. Where the virtues we value most in people are things like kindness and honesty and courage, dedication. But what's important is the good deeds you do that no one knows about. I think Bob belonged in the world with the culture of character. Because he had those throwback virtues that really matter. He was thoughtful. Every client of Bob's will tell you almost immediately that what they appreciated most was his thoughtful approach. In a world where everybody wants to get their two cents in, he was the guy who listened before he talked, and thought before he spoke. Just as more, more importantly, he was thoughtful as a friend. A colleague of Bob's, who Bob mentored closely, tells of when they're expecting their first child. And Bob gave them a gift. And this is what Bob's co-worker said, it wasn't a baby book or a baby outfit or any of the usual items you expect. It was a type of gift that spoke lines about Bob. His gift was simply a framed photo he had taken of a lion cub, cuddling up to his or her mother that he had taken um, during his travels. His card said, among all the wonderful sights in East, East Africa, this is one of the greatest. I hope you and your little one will enjoy this affirmation of life. And then another colleague, who was a really close friend of Bob's, um, saw that caring side of Bob on the other end of his life. Her dad had passed away, and Bob knew it was a hard time for her. And when she arrived back to the office after being away, um, she found sitting on her desk a wrap box, and inside it was a beautiful framed photo of a little bag. And this was many years ago, um, but she still tears up today when she tells that story. So he was thoughtful, and he was humble, right? He was incredibly low-key and understated. He never sought the spotlight. In fact, he ran from it. I think he did everything he could to avoid it. He was just proud of his work, and that was enough for Bob. He was dedicated. Did I tell you he worked at EPA for 37 years? I think I did. And I think he must have missed a day or two of work, but I don't ever remember it, really. He was just always there. And a colleague noted that nearly a day went by, even on Friday, when he wasn't impeccably dressed. Even in a bad suit, right? Um, and then while well, he never asked Bob about it, he liked to believe it was out of respect for the profession, his belief in the mission and public service ethic. He was dependable and loyal. You could count on Bob, right? And you could count on his advice. And that, I think, is an underrated and all too rare value. Bob knew the importance of showing up. And in a fast moving world where everything changes in the blink of an eye, Bob was steady and reliable and constant. He was patient. 
was unfailingly patient with clients. He was patient with our um, mentoring young lawyers. He was patient with impatient retail counsels. <laughs> He was also patient about the nature of our work, right? He knew that the fight for clean air wasn't going to be won in days, weeks, months, or years. It would take decades. He understood what Dr. King meant when he talked about the arc of the moral universe being long but bending towards justice. In a world with a short attention span, Bob knew the long game. <coughs> Above all else, he had integrity. He was, as they say, a lawyer's lawyer, which meant he had a deep and strong belief in the rule of law and no agenda, no ideology, other than doing what he could to ensure that the agency faithfully carried out that law. He was generally an easygoing guy, but he stood hard on principle, and there were lines he would not accept being crossed. As one of his co-workers said, I recall he was willing to say that everything the agency did was not the right thing. Every so often, he'd appear at my tour, and he'd wear his frustration on his face, clearly unhappy, and he'd ask me to get involved. Um, because despite his best efforts, somebody was about to do something he thought was not in accord with the law. And this happened more in the last years of his career, I think, and it frustrated him. But he never, ever gave up. He stayed true to his convictions. I'm sure after those hard days, he would come home and find sustenance to strength, strength with you, Diane. So when Bob retired, we officially and formally named one of our conference rooms the Judge Bob Room. Um, Two, as one of his closest colleagues said, remind us of him and of the integrity we seek to maintain every day. So I'll finish with this. I've been going to a lot of memorial services lately. I've had four close friends and relatives die in the last few months. I've been reflecting a lot on the notion of legacy. Everyone leaves a legacy, and including those four people. I have memories of them, but more importantly, things I've learned from them. The importance of family, the importance of empathy, the importance of community. And what I take from Bob, the importance of those traditional universal bedrock character values service, humility, thoughtfulness, patience, loyalty, and integrity. He was, as they say, a gentleman and a scholar. And so, perhaps an ultimate tribute to Bob, we have these purple bracelets in our office, right? Is anybody wearing them? If you are. <laughs> um, so, we had these made when Bob retired, and inscribed on them are four letters. WWBD, which stands for What Would Bob Do? Because <laughs> we all know at EPA that if you think about whatever problem you're facing from that perspective, you'll do the right thing. Thanks, David and David. Now it's time to meet Bob's brothers and mine. They each have something to share. Jim and Dave Eisenbrandt and Ed Patrick. That's it. I think Jim's leading on. I know that uh, Diane meticulously planned this event tonight. Uh, I'm not sure how she started out with three lawyers in a row. <laughs> but that's. Uh, that's where we are. Um, I want to talk about Bob as a brother, but I also need to do it kind of in three words. First, lawyer. We do have to talk about that. Second, consistent. And third, Kafka. <laughs> Those who know what I do for a living know that uh, the people that I represent are usually uh, in trouble and, uh, as I like to put it, generally misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> but from time to time I've had cases over at the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, early on I adopted the practice of going in and said, saying to whoever I was dealing with, well, do you know my brother, Bob Hanker? Of course, I'm trying, I know that Bob is well appointed, and I'm trying to give a little credibility with his people to argue my client's position. And uniformly, what I would get back would be, he was my mentor. 
He's one of the finest people that we have at the EPA. And then later, they started putting up his travel pictures, his nature pictures in the halls. And I would take the lawyers I was dealing with and say, yeah, that's Bob's picture. That's it. I took it over to Africa again because I knew how much Bob was valued. I never really knew if they went back and talked to Bob. I've learned at least once in a while they did. Diane told me the other day that I had been in the EPA in a case, and the lawyer I was dealing with went back to talk to Bob and said, your brother was in, what's he like? You know, what do I need to know about him? And Bob said, throw numbers at him, give him formulas. He doesn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm having to deal with formulas and math in your office, my client's in deep trouble. <laughs> but also there was one evening, I think Lou and I uh, were going out with Bob and Diane, and uh, Bob said, well, I hear you were in the office the other day. I said, yes, I was. And Diane said, well, who are you representing? And Bob said, Diane, he can't talk about it. <laughs> But I knew they were talking to him. <laughs> consistent. Bob was a consistent, bleeding heart, liberal, and proud of him. <laughs> he loved it. And I loved going over and having conversations with Bob, especially in the last few years. Because he and I would carry on wonderful conversations we never lost an argument. <laughs> we always agreed. And it was wonderful. Last June, when Bob was in the rehab hospital at KU, I went in one uh, Sunday morning to see him. And he was reading a copy of the New Republic, of course. And uh, we were talking. I think maybe about the murder trial that's going on out in Johnson County now uh, over the killing of the three people at the Jewish Community Center. And Bob turned to me and he said, you know, I don't think I'm sufficiently liberal on the death penalty. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm just kind of worried that I'm wobbling. So my remedy for that, of course, is I'm going out, I'm going to get you a copy of John Grisham's book entitled The Confession, and if you read this, that will get you back in line. <laughs> now, I don't know that Bob finished the book. I don't think he did. We never had a chance to finish the conversation. So, have conversations with people. Kafka. Bob had a long time uh, email address. And it was fkafka11 at aol.com. Now he recently changed it, I understand, which disappoints me greatly. <laughs> but I, I never related Bob and Kafka. So I thought. What I would do is, and Kafka is a guy who in his later years wanted everything he had written and not published burnt. And I think I'm going to read to you something that perhaps should have been burnt. <laughs> but this is a short story, it's about three paragraphs long by Kafka. We go to the city to see the law. Upon arrival, upon arrival outside the building, there's a card who says, You may not pass without permission. You notice, though, that the door is open, but it's closed enough for you to not see anything about the law. You point out, however, you can easily go into the building, and the guard agrees. Rather than be disagreeable, however, you decide to wait until you have permission. You wait for many years. 
and when you're old, an old, shriveled wreck, you get yourself to ask, during all the years I've waited here, no one else has tried to pass to see the law. Why is this? And the guard answers, it's true that no one else has passed here. That's because this door was always meant solely for you. But now it's closed forever. And then he proceeds to close the door and calmly walk away. Well, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I do know this. When the door of the law opened up, he rushed through it. He embraced it, and he left a better world because of it. And how do we know? We know because we can see cleaner skies, and we know because the people that he mentored who were carrying on, on the front. stage. <laughs> I always thought of myself as the bulky brother. <laughs> I thank Bob and Diane for this wonderful gathering which they planned today. I thank Bob for the tie. <laughs> I had no idea what this tie was, but <laughs> Bob likes it, I like. <laughs> I I want to briefly share that I spent a lot of time in the last two years with Bob, often bringing him Brian's barbecue to enjoy at home because he couldn't get out much. And when I would come over to Kansas City from Topeka, or when I'd call, it was always, how are you? It wasn't me saying, how are you, to Bob. I was trying to say, how are you, but it was Bob concerned about me. And, and I think that everybody here, many people here, it, 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 it's so good to hear people's different relationships to Bob, to Diane, various friendships, things I didn't know about. But everybody here probably knew that Bob was concerned about him, you. He wasn't concerned about himself. He always cared about you. And I just want everybody here to remember that, that Bob cares about you, and, and it's a better world because of you. to leave the eloquence to the attorneys. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming this evening to continue to celebrate the life of Bob Patrick. I'm Dave Eisenbrandt, and I'm Bob's stepbrother, and we always seem to end up having to say that because it helps to explain why we have different last names and why we don't look anything alike. <laughs> and again, who, who could duplicate Bob's Mark Twain look? <laughs> our, our families, as Kip told us, uh, our families joined together in grade school. We were young kids. And we grew up as four, five boys in a much more rural Johnson County like at 75th Street, there wasn't anything, but, um, you know, we 
we were just brothers. It, it really wasn't the stepbrother thing. We were very fortunate in that. Kip spoke to our parents and, and how they managed all that. And I, I can tell you this, why the dean and his wife would leave four boys alone in that house. <laughs> it's beyond me. <laughs> um, we developed a very special relationship with the local furniture dealer. <laughs> school kid that had a charge account. <laughs> um, so we all went to school as, as Kip described and uh, when I was a senior in the Shawnee Mission School District I met this beautiful young lady over there in purple, Carolyn Kaye's daughter Eisenbrandt and uh, I thought I'd ask her for a date so we went to the fall football game. Well Bob <laughs> didn't have a driver's license, so he came with us. So Bob went on our first date. <laughs> and he must have really liked Carolyn because we've all been hanging out for more than 50 years. So um, that, was, that was a good deal. Bob, uh, Carolyn and I started out at Kansas State University. Uh, this is very different than going to law school. The, the odors of coming in from the north really quite different than you would get at UMKC Law School. <laughs> but a couple years later, Bob joined us and became a wildcat. And of course, Bob's history, uh, history major, loved European history, dabbled in political science all that time. Um, and and I'll, uh, I'll tell you this, who, who else but Bob would name his dog Thucydides, the Greek historian? <laughs> How do you say here at the city? Apparently he was able to do that. <laughs> so as Carolyn and I finished up, Carolyn finished school, uh, Bob started a new chapter in his life. And our son Doug was born at, in Manhattan. He's a county. And Bob became Uncle Bob. And uh, we unfortunately missed the lovely Diane Sawyer's wedding to Bob Patrick because we were miles away and waiting for our daughter Laura to be born. But that was the start of Uncle Bob and Aunt Diane. Our, our kids were so blessed to have great aunts and uncles, Bob and Diane and Ed and Jane and Jim and Lou, to grow up with this extended cousins that uh, even though we kept moving around, they always worked together. Uh, we could get together for family, whether it was here in Kansas City or, or wherever we were living. And it was always a special relationship with aunts and uncles and cousins like I hope most families have had. Bob and Diane loved to travel. They had been to Europe before, and uh, we were very fortunate be able to travel with them to Vienna and Prague on one of our favorite trips, and I know one of Diane's and Bob's favorite trips. In fact, the the program that you received, the picture was Bob on a train going to Vienna uh, a few years back. And it was a great guy to travel around Europe with because he knew a lot about Europe. And Jim mentioned Kafka, but uh, I will tell you this do more on the science side of things. Uh, we were walking through Old Town Prague and there was a plaque on the door and it said, Home of Kafka. And rhetorically I said, Who's Kafka? <laughs> well, 30 minutes later, <laughs> I, I, I knew who he was, a lawyer, a writer, uh, but I had not a clue what he was all about, um, just, just like Jim ended up not. <laughs> we, we've heard a few times about Bob's photography as well as his wildlife photography. Um, it really was spectacular. He was patient. He was technically an expert. Um, and we're, we're so pleased that some of his photos grace our walls. We, we very much appreciate that. And we know how proud of that, that, that he was. Um, I, I want to thank all the folks from the EPA and the tributes that Diane passed along. I, I can tell you, I think all of the brothers that helped us 
see the Bob career professional in, in ways that we have. So we very much appreciate that. And it was also fun to read that some of the uh, folks at EPA could peel back that Bob onion a little bit and see, <laughs> see the real Bob that was there and all, all the fun things that he did and, and he liked to do. Uh, I, I will say that even though Bob enjoyed his years at, in the University of Missouri system, I think a lot of us bond with our undergraduate schools a lot. And for Bob and Diane and Carolyn and me, that was Kansas State University. And it was so great that Bob was down there and we could get together. Um, and even recently, uh, we had a chance to tailgate with Bob and Diane and Saji. And, uh, and we, and actually, the place they liked the best was and closest to the stadium was the vet school parking lot, so that was kind of special <laughs> for me. And we got to meet their friends and had some good broths and Diet Coke, I guess it was. Um, so, so that was a very special experience. I, I would also like to mention the, the Robert L. Patrick Memorial Fund that Bob and Diane have set up at K-State. I think it's really going to be a lasting tribute to Bob himself and to his wonderful career. Um, I just want to mention, too, again, that Bob and Diane shared their lives and their experiences so much and really enjoyed each other and supported each other in so many ways. And we're so grateful to the care that Diane provided over the last couple of years especially. I mean, hardly anybody else could have provided that kind of support um, as well as the rest of our family. We, we so much appreciate that. Just like Ed said, Bob would not talk about his illness. Um, we, we live out of state, so it was usually phone calls and how are you doing? Everything. He would every time use his lawyerly skills to just change the subject. <laughs> and, and you know, after I hung up, I would be, you know, did he do that again? But <laughs> he was always able to do that. Um, he was very courageous. Uh, I, I think only a few close people really knew how courageous he was over the last month. So I will miss my brother greatly. And I know he's going to be missed by the family and all of his friends, but really grateful for the time and the experience that we shared with this really special guy. Now let's uh, skip a generation and meet two of Bob's nephews. Ed and Jane's son Josh, and that would be Joshua Robert Patrick, named for Uncle Bob, and Jim and Lou's son Matt. I think you got it. I'm, I'm Joshua Robert Patrick. Because <laughs> it's a lot of first names. Um, <laughs> so I'm known as Josh. Um, I answer to Patrick, you know, all the Patrick men answer to Patrick, and, and women, um, sometimes as well. Eisenbrands don't have that problem. <laughs> um, so, and, and then in my life I was, have been occasionally, but affectionately known as Josh Bob, um, and, which is a really weird thing growing up, because it's not, you know, the adults know what they're talking about, but you don't know what they're talking about. So it was always, Josh Bob will figure it out. <laughs> or, I talked to Josh, you know, it's going to be okay. Josh, Josh, Josh Bob's got it under control. Um, so I have the good fortune to live in a, a small town uh, called Whitefish Bay, which is just north of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I live there with my wife, Jennifer, and daughter, Evie, um, and son, Jacob. Um, we live right on the shore uh, of Lake Michigan, and we spend a lot of time at the lake. Uh, we, I, I, I go there because I love the view. Um, I, I love the colors at the lake. And um, it's funny, 
time, you know, I've only lived there recently, but there's a period of, of Milwaukee's history where people stopped going to the lake. Um, and um, looking, looking through the history of Bob's career, it's, it's just fascinating to think about the arc of that. And, and in my hometown, the Milwaukee River, um, by 1970, there were four native species left in the river, and there's 29 today. And that basically expands the arc of, of um, Bob's career at the EPA, and that's not, not something that's lost on me. So thank you, Uncle Bob, for the view. So just about every day I go to the lake. I go there because of the view. I go there because um, it's a thin place. Um, what the culture would call a thin place. It's a place on earth where, for at least a moment, the veil between um, the present world and the world that you can't touch and feel um, forever gets lifted. Um, I can stand at the shore of Lake Michigan and look from the, the grains of sand at my feet to the water lapping onto the shore. Um, these are things I can touch and understand. Um, but from there, I can, can look at the immensity of the water and, and see too much water even, even to see the other shore. Um, and then usually there's a, there's a really fine line above the lake. You can't see the other side of it, but, but where the real world, the world that, that we know ends and, and forever begins up above. So above um, the line is where you see the fog, the, the, the cloud, um, or, or all three. Sometimes the lake just looks like a giant platter and you see the sun and moon sort of, sort of rise out of it. Um, I go there to see reflections, um, and lately I've been reflecting on my uncle, of course. Um, I learned so much from Uncle Bob, but he wasn't um, a teacher um, in, the, in the common sense of the word. He, he taught by his own example, as, as you already hear, hear today. Um, Bob taught me what cool is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bob would wear, he'd, we'd meet him on a Saturday afternoon and he'd be wearing a Quiet Riot t-shirt. Which was like, that, that was like a step beyond what I could handle <laughs> when, when I was a kid. Um, and it was really, even at a young age, you could sense that Bob's coolness was not something that was like, it, it wasn't out of self-awareness, it was more out of self-expression. He wasn't necessarily concerned. He, he just didn't seem to need to fit in like other adults um, in my life did. Um, Bob was cool because his nickname was Bob the Slob. <laughs> and I'm so happy we got to this point without you hearing about that. <laughs> as a kid, that, and so it's cool, right? But then you ask, well, why, why are you calling Bob the Slob? And his brothers would say, well, it's because when he was a kid, he was so clean. And which he's a clean adult too, but that doesn't quite make sense. Um, so I finally um, just ended up making up my own reason. I, I decided that, um, or I understood that Bob the Slob was a term of endearment, and it was a way for his brothers to simply say, you look better than us even when you aren't trying. Um, Bob showed me that if you go to school, you can get a ju do good job and do interesting meaningful things. And then I learned if you keep doing this, eventually you can you know, be able to do and buy really cool things. <laughs> so we, and Bob, Bob was always a step ahead. He was into video games. We were into video games, but he had the Atari 5200. <laughs> we just had the, the original Atari. Um, and then he got into cars. So, so we would have the Matchbox cars. Bob would have the real cars, <laughs> which, was, which was amazing. Um, Bob and Diana, birthdays and holidays um, were, were unique amongst uncles because they gave gifts, but they gave money as a gift, which, <laughs> which is great as a kid, but they, it, it was, I, I really think it was a conscious effort to, to give a choice. I mean, they weren't making a, a choice on our behalf. They were teaching us to choose. Um, of course, Bob was um, at all the family activities. Um, some of them were famously hosted by him. Um, but it was the time when Bob, um, or my brother and sister and I got to spend with Bob that I remember most today, and that's, he'd take us to the mall to play video games. Um, <laughs> Bob and Diane took us to Star Wars movies for the first time. So that, that's the type of, type of animal that they were. Um, as, we, as we got older, um, we continued to talk about um, music, and it was funny, no matter how 
off the chart he got from my own perspective. I just thought Bob was cooler. <laughs> um, in later years, Bob, Bob taught me that presence um, is a gift. Um, I didn't always live in town, as many of us did, but when we go to visit Grandma and Grandpa, there was always some evidence that Bob was there. There was some biscuit or something that, that Grandpa had, had um, stocked away for Sachi. Bob taught me that quiet is okay. It is okay. Right? <laughs> um, he showed me how to be a better son, a better husband, a um, better uncle. You know, but there was a time, I guess, when, when I got older that, that I could have been maybe a little bit jealous or resented Bob a bit because he did get all the male hairs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> he even got some of Doug's hair. Which, I don't, that's, we don't know how that is. Um, let's see. And so Bob, I, my, the way I remember Bob is he had the whole Einstein with the Pink Floyd t-shirt thing yeah. just nailed. Nobody, nobody could do it better. Um, as Bob, in the last years, Bob really continued to teach, um, and it's already been mentioned, there was no woe is me with, with, Bob's, um, with Bob's illness. He would literally apologize for, for, for the fuss, and I really think both Bob and Diane um, set an example for you know, something that we're all going to have to deal with. It's pretty amazing to watch. Um, so then, of course, they did everything they could, right? But then there were times when there was nothing left to do. Um, and, and Bob filled those times up, too. And one of the stories that um, I want to I tell that's just really emblematic of, of Bob in his last years, um, he, was, he was really, really sick and having trouble getting me nutrients down and um, they finally decided well let's try it. let's give him a milkshake let's see if he'll, he'll have that and, and he agreed to it um, and so to explain the rest you need to understand the movie Pulp Fiction um, but there's, a, there's a fairly famous scene with John Travolta and Emma Thurman, Thurman and they're talking about a milkshake and it's a five dollar milkshake and uh, John Travolta this is back when he could still talk <laughs> and gets this shake. He's talking to him with Thurman. He gets this shake, and he talks about the shake, and he says, "That's a five dollar motion. That's a five dollar bleep bleep motion. Or that's not a five dollar. How do I say it? Bleep and motion. Yeah." <laughs> Milkshake, but it's not a five dollar bleeping milkshake. Return to Bob's um, bedroom or hospital bed. My brother brings Bob a shake, um, hands, hands Bob a shake, and Bob's reply after kind of struggling to get some down is, Now that's a five dollar. <laughs> so thank you, Bob. It, it, it really was a five dollar milkshake. <laughs> So Bob died on a Saturday night. Um, the next day, I, I went to Lake Michigan like I normally do. So I went through the um, rustling of the wind and the leaves. Um, it was overcast. The water was bright blue, though, and it, like the brightest type of blue that you could only see in, in, in somebody's eyes, and it reminded me of uh, Bob's eyes. When I looked, though, from the sand up to the water, and then and then to the clouds. I looked up and the lake was completely missing. Um, there was no horizon at all. It was, it was completely gone. And I just recognized that the Bob that was here and the Bob that are gone are not so far away from each other. I could feel his presence, his assurance, and be comfortable in this new type of silence. And then I thought, Josh, Bob, you really need to get a hold of yourself. <laughs> So if you find that Bob is missing, you may need to go look for him. Go to a thin place, look up. If it feels like rain, let the tears fall. Then feel the breeze, watch the sunrise. You'll find him there.
So, what Josh just told you about is, is um, when I was trying to think about what to say, um, is very, you know, is very similar to, I think, how all of us as cousins uh, felt about Uncle Bob. When we were exchanging emails among us, thinking of memories, um, it, it felt like there were sort of these two camps of memories. There was the, the years we were growing up, and then our time with Bob uh, as adults. And I think what's cool in there is that Bob never changed. We just grew up. Um, and Josh told you a few of the stories from our younger years. Um, and I have one more that I want to add, uh, but I also do want to talk about Bob more in the recent years. Um, in exchanging these e emails, um, the younger years did seem to revolve around video games and heavy metal music. Uh, so my cousin Doug had a couple of good stories about that. I'm going to pick out one, which seems to bring in every element that we've all talked about. Um, so I'm just going to read you what Doug wrote. One of the times we came through Kansas City during the summer, I remember getting to ride and drive one of Uncle Bob's sports cars. I believe it was the Mazda RX-7. I just remember he took me out on the highway with Ozzy Osbourne blaring <laughs> and his crazy hair getting crazier in the wind. <laughs> then he pulled off the highway and he told me to drive. That's Uncle Bob. <laughs> I was more than happy to wind it out and see how high I could get the RPMs before each shift. I remember thinking, how am I going to explain to the cop and to my parents <laughs> that listening to Crazy Train on the highway meant you had to go fast. <laughs> you didn't have a choice. And I think what's great is that Uncle Bob better than anybody knew that. Um, the other thing that Doug included in his email was a good line that Josh has already mentioned, which is, I, he's, Doug wrote, I think if there was one word to describe Uncle Bob for me, it was cool. He was so even keeled and monotone that if you didn't pay attention, his coolness would just pass you by. So one of the interesting things in thinking about the memories is, um, I think for me when I was a kid, I think actually Bob's coolness did pass me by. Um, some of the older cousins had slightly better memories of, of some of the, especially the heavy metal. I really didn't remember that so much. Um, but what was, what's been great for me as an adult is um, really having the chance to get a lot closer to Bob and to Diane uh, as we've been adults and, and started to really, truly appreciate his coolness. Um, I, you know, one of the things was that, you know, growing up, you know, I think I knew Bob was a lawyer at the EPA, but that was all I knew. It didn't mean that much to me. Um, now as an adult, and certainly sitting in this room today, I understand Bob work, Bob's work and his dedication to environmental issues and to a lot of other issues that he felt, uh, felt important about. Um, I've now been a human rights lawyer for 13 years and a human rights activist. Um, and as I started down that path, Bob always showed a very keen interest. And Bob and Diane have always shown me really, truly amazing support that, um, you know, sometimes when you're working in the nonprofit world, you really need that. Um, I, I had great conversations with Bob um, that I just, I think when I was a kid, I didn't really know that kind of stuff was, was possible. Um, and we would have really fantastic conversations about political topics or activism or whatever. Um, and one of the things I'll always remember was um, I was doing an event in New York. Um, 
and on one of the cases we were working on one of the human rights cases and Bob and Diane came and um, I can't tell you how much that meant to me to have them there. My wife recently graduated law school um, and she'll soon be working in a legal position for the government. We live up in Vancouver, Canada and she's going to be working for the, um, the provincial government there. And the last time we saw Bob, uh, Jen and I went over, and it was, it was so amazing to see how excited he was uh, for her. And especially about the rotation she's going to be doing for the environmental section. <laughs> so this will be my um, enduring memory of Bob, is how much enthusiasm he had for the things he cared about. Even if he did it with that cool personality, that we all remembered as kids, and that he always did it with his radio blaring and his crazy hair blowing in the breeze. Now it's time to hear from Bob's better half. And if Bob were here, I would say his way better half. <laughs> The two of them have shared adventures and dreams and joys and sorrows together for 45 years of marriage. This lady is Mrs. Robert B. Patrick. Thank you everyone uh, for being here to celebrate Bob's life. Bob would be so thrilled with your presence as I am. I also want to thank of family, friends, and colleagues for their wonderful love and support during Bob's illness. I also want to thank the Diastole for hosting our celebration today and for my wonderful planning team who you see around here helping in so many uh, caring and expert roles. So it's wonderful. Jonathan and Zach, our friends and neighbors, took care of our little beloved Sachi while I was with uh, Bob in the hospital, I want to thank them. Uh, they gave both Bob and I great peace of mind. I want to especially honor our niece, Elise, uh, who was there with Bob and I as Bob passed away. She did this with love and compassion. This was the tough duty. Uh, there were no accolades or fanfare, and she was so caring and supportive. I am forever grateful to Elise. Elise, will you come forward and say a few words? <laughs> so I, I did write a few things and I'm going to keep it quick. I'd like to thank you all for sticking with us throughout <laughs> this. Uh, so I don't think there's anything that I can say that hasn't been said about Bob already, so um, I'll just say that it was a real honor and privilege for me to be there um, with Diane and with Bob in his final hours. And uh, excuse me, how special it was to be um, able to see Bob frequently uh, in, in the weeks and months. Prior, um, I'm going to get it together because I, I just want to share a little bit. Um, as many of you know, or some of you probably don't know, my parents, um, Jane and Ed, Patrick, spend their summers up in Wisconsin. And so they usually leave uh, mid-May, a little bit before Memorial Day, and don't come back till the end of September. So, um, so... They, my dad, in the time when he's home in Topeka, he visits Bob regularly, uh, weekly. And so, um, in May, we considered it a pretty big deal when, um, to say goodbye to my parents and to wish Bob and Diane well. Um, we had a Mother's Day gathering at, at our house, my husband, Aaron, and I. And so, we were really excited that Bob and Diane could join us. and. Um, that was great, and so then the next day they headed to Colorado to see David Carolyn and, and visit part of their 
part of the world that they really love. Um, Bob didn't do as well on that trip as we had all hoped and ended up in the ICU shortly after. Um, and this was about when my parents were heading home, we were heading up north for the summer. And I knew how hard it was for them to leave with Bob as ill as he was. And so even though they could still talk on the phone, I thought it was important for me to step up at that point and, and be a representative for my parents and my brothers. Um, but I didn't do that out of obligation and nobody asked me to do that. And I know Diane would have never asked me to, to do that. So I just really, um, but it was just something I needed to do. Um, it's also something that um, in my young adulthood I sort of realized at some point, and I don't know if I was ever asked or told, but that I would, I would need to be there for Bob and Diane as they aged. Um, and so, and so it just seemed like a role I would assume and a role that I was glad to assume. Um, I just thought it was going to be a lot later in life that I would have a little bit more experience under my belt <laughs> um, before this all happened. But um, I just want all of you to know that those last hours um, were not hard at all. Um, people have told me, you know, that this must have been the hard job and that you really did the difficult duty. And I, I can't say enough that it was, it was again, my, my pleasure and my honor to be there. Um, especially to share a brief moment with Bob as Diane left the room um, to reassure him that, that Diane was wrong. Excuse me. This is embarrassing. Uh, that Diane would be okay and that we would all be there for her and that I will continue to be there for her. So, um, and that it meant a lot to me to be able to be there for my parents. So excuse my blubbering, I didn't expect that. <laughs> was the love of my life, my soulmate, and my best friend. He's a part of me and all, will always be. We were married on the K-State campus at the beautiful little Danforth Chapel. We wrote our own vows and followed with 45 wonderful years of marriage. We grew up together, we supported each other, and we were equal partners in shaping our lives. Bob proposed to me in a very traditional way at K-State by a beautiful statue in the middle of the campus on one knee with poetry at hand and lamenting that as a grad student he was not yet worthy of me but would work toward becoming so. I was very impressed <laughs> and I saw great potential. <laughs> I admired Bob for his principles and sense of duty. He had an inner compass and knew right from wrong what was important and what was not in all aspects of his life. He highly valued public service to carry out EPA's mission to achieve a cleaner and healthier environment. He never drifted from that commitment, staying the course for 37 years. He loathed injustice. He quietly and proudly, for example, wore a hoodie to social occasions <laughs> to call attention to injustices inflicted on young men of color. He most valued from our college days observing a street dialogue between his personal hero, Muhammad Ali, and local youth. He met and shook hands with Bobby Kennedy. As husband and partner, he was my anchor, ardent protector, and defender. He knew how I loved my mother, who sacrificed for my benefit, and he honored her with a three-week trip to Europe on our six-week honeymoon. I admired Bob for his courage and determination in life and in illness. He and his brother had planned a trip to visit the polar bears in Churchill, Canada this November. And in spite of health challenges, he never gave up, and he never canceled his reservation. As a colleague shared, Bob would be proud that EPA has moved forward with rules to curb greenhouse gases, giving the polar bears a better chance. 
I admired Bob for his strong intellect generously shared. He believed in personal intellectual growth and in science. He was amazed, low those many years ago with the Apollo moon landing in 1969, and as we gazed up at that beautiful moon from Manhattan, Kansas, we knew all things were possible. His <coughs> master's report was on the history of science. He began mentoring me in college, suggesting I apply for a government and action semester at American University, which I pursued. He always encouraged me in my educational and public service career experiences. <coughs> he supported my goal to expand my community development career by working at a national nonprofit office in New York City. We made an adventure of it with Bob and our beloved dog Sachi uh, walking and hanging out in Central Park. And of course, Sachi always flew first class to New York City. <laughs> we hosted fun family holidays and friends visits to explore all that the city offers. Bob told me that my conversation had become more interesting as I explored New York City. <laughs> he totally shared the experience and was proud of my ability to navigate it. He treasured the new friends we made there. I admired Bob for being a kind and gentle soul. I always felt he was a great writer and asked him to capture some thoughts on Saatchi, our dog. Here is what he left behind, a two-page essay displayed on the memorabilia table in the Omar room. It's entitled The Saatchi Files, <laughs> which, includes, which concludes the three of us, Saatchi, Diane, and I, formed the solid bond, the solid team over the years, a bond which could not be broken. Though the human bond goes back much further in time, it was completed by the tough little dog that has graced our lives. I admire Bob for his sense of fun, walking Saatchi in Loose Park, visiting the Japanese garden, smoking ribs and fish, tailgating at K-State, watching soccer, driving red sports cars, and traveling from Colorado to East Africa to photograph and savor nature's beauty. I admire him for his dry wit and sense of humor. He saw the world through his own unique lens and used key phrases to tease me continuously, such as buckaroo bonsai's, eyes, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> In summary, he was a mentor to me, proud of my public service career, and committed to my personal happiness. I always felt his total love and support, and he made me a better person all along the way. I am proud to have had this handsome, strong, and compassionate gentleman as my husband, soulmate, and best friend. Our love and relationship was transformative to my life. I cherish the many tributes from EPA colleagues. They have meant so much to our family and to myself. One colleague recalled that sharing an EPA, EPA engagement with Bob in 1999 in which there was a rare phenomenon of a blue moon which occurred twice that year. And in July of this year, when Bob passed away, there was also a blue moon. And seeing that glorious moon reminded her of being grateful for what Bob did to make our sky clear and bright and beautiful, and the air we breathe safe and pure and healthy. I would like to read one tribute from EPA colleague Amy Bassanya, who is here with us. It's entitled, My Air Quality Hero, Bob Patrick. <laughs> Dear Bob, you are my super air quality hero. In your air quality superhero uniform, suit and tie, and your hair blown wild from swooping in to save the day, your extraordinary spirit will be with me always. You always had an answer, and it was always the right answer, even if I didn't want it to be the answer. Your guidance and advice contained a wealth of history, knowledge, and information, all wrapped up in a gentle explanation. This was your superhero strength. Your patience and willingness to guide us through our ever-sticky air quality issues. You may, have you may have taken off for greater superhero adventures. I know the world is just not big enough to contain your ultimate superhero-ness. 
that you leave us your legacy, your memory, and our guiding principle and motto, WWBW, what would Bob do? Thank you, Bob. Your superhero spirit is in all of us, she said. And to my husband, you are forever my superhero. Mm -hmm. I think we're in the midst of making a slight technical adjustment. Battery life being what it is, I'm guessing. Sorry, everyone in the other room. There you go. Now let me introduce uh, Jennifer Christensen, Jim and Lou's daughter, who will read a poem, Our Place in the World, by Tim Amston, a retired EPA attorney and a dear friend of Bob's. Nobody's mentioned the margaritas. Bob made a great margarita. <laughs> Sorry, I felt I needed to say that. <laughs> Thinking about that, that's what he did. Um, our place in the world. On the winter solstice, the darkest day of the year, old friends gather, as, as people have since humanity began. Beneath ponderosas and star-blasted sky, bundled and warmed by hot buttered rum, they huddled around an evening fire. Murmurs of conversations quiet, as one lifts his guitar from its case and begins strumming and singing an old song of love and memory. Voices of the others gradually, gradually join until all are singing, a soft yearning together, a binding moment as each gazes into the fire and gently blends their voice into the whole. Above their heads, their hearts twine into a tiny goldfinch that rises through swirling snow till it joins the vast circle of birds made in their ways by Maori and Maasai and Zuni and all the other families of people. The circle expands until it spins around the earth. The earth ceases to wobble and its voice clarifies into the high ting of a rung go goblet and the angels pause in their work to cry the perfected note. And that music uh, makes, it makes a nice segue for me because we wouldn't be celebrating Bob accurately with having some music, right? So to give us a taste of some of Bob's musical tastes, let me introduce Mastin Tapp and Zachary Birch. Bob and Diane have attended several performances of Mastin's, son of EPA colleague Bob's Josh Tapp and his wife Brene. Gentle soul that he was, Bobby, as we've heard, did like his metal. So how about a little Jimi Hendrix and some Pink Floyd, let the rockin' begin. <laughs>
Uh, in conclusion, <laughs> we invite you to enjoy the Diasley Center. Please explore its beauty and collections, room to room, and it, it goes all the way up to the 18th floor, whatever. There's a huge high level. <coughs> You'll find friends and memories of Bob's. You might also want to enjoy a taste of a special 1973 Glen Livet Scotch at $800 a bottle that Diane purchased for Bob and is now, for some reason, she's willing to be sharing. Be sharing. <laughs> You'll find some of Bob's favorite margaritas uh, at the bar and his famous Mexican fudge to share on the hors d'oeuvre table. There's a memorabilia table in the dining room and we'd like you all to have the chance to sign the guest book if you would. Finally, we all know that life is a battle whose outcome is inevitable. But kid brothers aren't supposed to go first. Makes no sense. Just not fair. Curse you, cancer. But whether or not life is fair, it seems to me that we as human beings on this planet have the job to make sure that we spend whatever time we have to the fullest. Living each day with compassion and grace, facing each challenge with intelligence and courage. No one did that better than Bob Patrick. Thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>